Greetings, dear brothers and sisters. In the holy, mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, once again to Messiah and Messiah alone be all the praise, honor, and glory. And today is the eighth day, right, Anna? Yes. Yeah, today is the eighth day of the twelfth month. We are in the last month of 2020, dear brothers and sisters, and today... I'm here once again to help our 11-year-old daughter Anna today. Messiah wanted Anna to share three very urgent visions which Messiah gave. Three very urgent vision, visions which Anna tried to draw for us. And as she shares, we will once again try to hold it up on screen, dear brothers and sisters. And two very urgent words. Two very urgent words, Messiah, I believe with five times at least five times with escalating urgency messiah is telling us dear brothers and sisters that time is upon us time is indeed at hand messiah is telling us without taking away from the word which messiah gave anna dear brothers and sisters that messiah is telling that this is the time that there is no more time messiah is telling you are living in the end moments and then he says he throws a curveball and says Deception is everywhere, dear brothers and sisters. The question today is once again, the question today is, are we going to trust? Are we going to spiritually discern this word, whether it aligns with the word of God? And ask the Lord, seek him, seek him with all our heart, strength, mind and soul with our entire being and ask. The Lord that what time we are in, dear brothers and sisters. And then Messiah says in today's word that until I come, hold fast what you have. Until I come, hold fast what you have. What that what does that exactly mean, dear brothers and sisters? Messiah is telling us to hold fast to what you have. As a matter of fact, Revelation 3:11, Messiah says that. Revelation 3.11 says, Messiah says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown, dear brothers and sisters. We, unfortunately, are aligned to the x-axis, to the horizontal axis. And we hold fast to the things of this world, our ambitions, our worldly pursuits, and on goes the list, dear brothers and sisters. Messiah is telling us Revelation 3, 10 and 11. Messiah says, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. All dwellers will be tested. That's what Messiah is telling us. And then Messiah says, behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown, dear brothers and sisters. We understand, behold, I am coming quickly. Then we just take, we become myopic and just take that statement and start digging deeper. When is that? How quickly is quickly? That's not what Messiah is telling. Messiah is telling his return is upon us. That's the next thing in Messiah's calendar, dear brothers and sisters. Are we going to take him at his word? And that takes obedience, dear brothers and sisters. We talk so much about typos. We talk so much about types and patterns of rapture. When we see Noah, we talk about Noah boarding Noah's ark. What did, what was missing in Noah's boat? It was a staggering design. We know the blueprint. It was a staggering design, one of its kind. But what was missing in Noah's boat? Noah's boat was without a sail and without a rudder. I repeat, dear brothers and sisters, Noah's boat was without a sail and without a rudder. The two very important things which we need to control the direction and destination. But Noah obeyed Messiah, obeyed Hashem, and he did not ask about the sail. He did not ask about the rudder. He trusted Hashem that he who gave the blueprint about the barge, to build the barge, he knows it all. Today the question is, Messiah is telling us, behold, I am coming quickly. Is the question how quick is that quickly? Or is the question that I need to get my life in order aligned to what Messiah's calling is? 
Dear brothers and sisters, the question is between obedience or preference. Every believer must choose whether he will live by the principle of obedience, by yielding to the spirit of Hashem, to the spirit of Yeshua HaMashiach, or follow his or her own preferences by gratifying his, his or her flesh. When a person commits to doing Messiah's will, Hashem's will, then every situation and every decision is sifted through the standard of God said it, so I am going to do it. And that's the end of it. There is no logic. There are no background research going on. Spiritual discernment does not come from Google, dear brothers and sisters. Spiritual discernment comes from God. So God said it. His word says, period, I am going to do it in my flesh. I don't have the strength, but I will go to my prayer closet and I will wrestle with God. Help me to believe that your return is upon me, Lord. Because you said, behold, I am coming quickly. In the days that remain, Lord, teach me to do your will. Not my will, but only your will. Dear brothers and sisters, it may seem foolish sometimes. Extremely foolish and preposterous. And a lot of times very difficult, extremely difficult. He or she may complain, weep, or try to argue. But in the end, he or she will be obedient. A true born again believer who is whose heart is truly regenerated by the supernatural power of Messiah's Ruach. No matter what, in the end, he or she will be obedient. No matter what. And deny his flesh and he indeed yield to the Spirit. We don't rebel against God and his word, but we wrestle against the evil powers of darkness, the principalities, Hashatan himself. Because God has given us the authority, Luke 10, 19, to trample on every snakes and scorpions and evil powers of darkness. James 4, 7 gives us the power to resist the devil when we submit to God. Dear brothers and sisters, through all these words and visions, all these messages to all our different fellow brethren, Hashem is doing each one of us a favor by informing us about Messiah's extremely imminent return. Our faith is about to become sight. It is time to get excited. It is time truly to thank God. It is time to truly be prostrate and say that this is the generation, O oh Lord. I don't understand. I cannot believe in my flesh, but I choose to trust your word. Help me, Lord, to trust, to trust, to trust your word. But the question is, are we thankful about all these messages? Are we going and asking, why is Messiah giving us so many messages about his return? Or are we complaining and grumbling? Messiah is doing us a favor by letting us know, dear brothers and sisters, about his extremely imminent return and all he wants from you and me from us is to believe him, to trust him, and take him at his word. Yes, dear brothers and sisters, some days we fall and fail to take Hashem at his word. And sometimes so many questions arise. And Messiah, so certainly, our Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach understands, understands our need to question, cry out, and petition him for the strength to do what he asks us to do. Hebrews 4.15, I believe, tells us that we have a high priest who can sympathize with us. Messiah wasn't extremely excited or happy about the cross. Dear brothers and sisters, as we understand from Matthew, the gospel accounts, Messiah grieved over the coming separation from his father, as we understand from the prayer at Garden of Gethsemane. Nevertheless, Messiah was committed to follow Hashem's will. Matthew 26, 39 says, O oh, Holy Father, not my will, but thy will be done. It was not the agony of the cross, but it was the pangs of separation. Messiah's separation from his, our Heavenly Father. That was what Messiah was bothered about, concerned about. No one took Messiah's life from him. He laid it down, dear brothers and sisters. John 10, 18 tells us that. 
He laid it down knowingly and willingly for you and me so that me and you don't have to rot in the lake of fire for eternity. Today are we thankful? Are we thankful about it? Our lives are all about fulfilling Hashem's ordained purposes. We are saved unto good works, Ephesians 2.10 tells us. Many people miss Hashem's staggering plan for them because they choose to follow their pre preferences. Obedience is sometimes hard, but the struggle and sacrifice are worth it because Messiah will walk us through every step by step. There is joy and peace for every true born again believer who pleases the Lord and lives by his principles by moment by moment denying his flesh and yielding to Ruach HaKodesh. Today in Messiah's word, as a matter of fact, Messiah gives us instructions about what exactly to do, dear brothers and sisters, in the days that remain. But the question is, are we ready to pay heat? Are you? Or are we going to do how our flesh dictates us? Is Are we going to live by preferences or by obedience? Because preferences put into flesh. And obedience put into Messiah. The Holy One of Israel. Today, will you let Messiah transform your life? And if so, today, as a matter of fact, Anna has a message for us once again, solely guided, solely guided by the Spirit of the One True Living God, by Messiah's Ruach, which can indeed, indeed give us a new perspective in the days that remain, a new perspective to how to actually deal with this world and this is once again i believe it's the third session the third session in this eschat eschatology series which messiah led anna to start and we will leave the link for session one and two in the in the comment section dear brothers and sisters if messiah leads you once again please do take a look at it let us understand dear brothers and sisters we are at war we are not home yet we are on enemy's turf this world Belongs as of now. As of now, 1 John 5, 19, the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. But soon and very soon, as we see Revelation 4 and 5 tells us, Messiah is going to take the title deed. And that's access. Messiah is going to take the title deed. And soon and very soon, Messiah is going to take us home, dear brothers and sisters. So let us to deep our hearts. And surrender, sur surrender all of ourselves from the crown of our head to the sole of our feet to our living God. And this time of ours in a way that let us petition that Messiah can direct us, guide us and once again nourish our souls. So there be a revival in our relationship with our Redeemer, our one true living God, Yeshua HaMashiach. So today... Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Let Messiah's will be done during this time. Let us petition together with all our heart, strength, mind and soul. So that Messiah's will is done through us and in us during this time. So let us go to the Lord in prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Let's bow our heads. And let us pray. Shall we? Anna? Yes. All right. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, Holy Father, as we come in thy presence, we give you all the praise and honor and glory. We Thank you, Father, for being our holy, heavenly Father. Oh, holy Father, we stagger, we stagger, Lord, as we begin to embrace the extremes, incredible, incredible extremes, Lord, that you have gone on our behalf that we might have life and life in abundance on your side of eternity with you one day, Lord. We thank you, Holy Father, that by thy grace and thy grace alone, God's riches at Christ's expense, you have called each one of us and not by any merit of our own. We thank you, Holy Father, that you have allowed your only begotten Son, our Messiah Yeshua HaMashiach, to purchase our liberty from the law, to purchase our redemption, our access to you. Father, we also thank you for the Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, that he is so diligent to open the scriptures to the diligent. Today we pray, Father, that once again as we bring all our dear fellow brethren, every single of our dear brothers and sisters in your presence, all your appointed people, Lord, and we pray that please once again if you would give each one of us, each one of our dear fellow brethren, a renewed appetite if you would increase in each one of us and give us a new appetite, a renewed hunger, Lord, for thee and thy word, that we each may grow in the grace and knowledge of our Adonai, Yeshua HaMashiach. But also, Father, we each might be more discerning, 
more perceptive to what you precisely have for each one of us in the days that remain, Lord. We thrill, Father. We thrill, Father, as we discover in your word the exciting demonstrations of your precision and your love. And yet, Father, and yet, Father, as we behold the horizon and we sense the urgency of the perilous times we are living in, we do seek discernment, Father. We do seek discernment that we might know what it is you would have each one of us do. For we do understand, Father, that opportunity is not mandated, that you have called each one of us to a specific task. Oh, Holy Father, today we pray that we pray if you would through your Holy Spirit. Please make that evidently clear to each one of us. That in the days that remain, we might be each more fruitful and faithful stewards of the opportunities, Lord, you are presenting us with. Father, today, once again, I bring Anna and myself in your presence, Lord, and pray, Lord, today. Please be our strength, Lord, in our weaknesses. Today, once again, we anoint every alphabet which comes out of our mouth, Lord, oh, Holy Father, whatever is not from you, please let it not happen. The Bible says, Matthew 19, 26, that through us, it is impossible, but through you, everything, everything is possible. So we claim on Psalm 141, verse 3, and pray, Father, that please do set a guard over our mouths and keep watch, Lord, over the door of our lips as we convey thy message, Lord, to thy appointed people. And right this moment in the name of our coming and reigning King, Yeshua. Yeshua HaMashiach, using our authority of Luke 10, 19, we bind every evil of the enemy which is coming at this time, coming at this message, coming at all of your fellow brethren, every single of our dear brothers and sisters. And we pray, we pray for the hedge of protection for each one of us. And Father, once again, we pray that may this message reach to thy appointed people, Lord, to accomplish only your mighty will. And please, please do enlighten the hearts and minds of all our dear fellow brethren, every single of our dear brothers and sisters, through your Holy Spirit, Lord, to understand what you precisely have for each one of them through this message. All this we pray in the holy, mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, our reigning and coming King, our Lord and Savior, our soul sustainer, our breath giver, and our all in all indeed. Amen. Amen. And amen and amen. And you can please go ahead then. So on the 24th day of the 11th month of this year, 2020, they heard the Lord say, My child, this is the time of my coming. There is no more time. You are living in the end moments and deception is everywhere. Tell my people to trust in me. Tell them not to give in to the lies of the enemy. Do not look to the right or to the left. I will be with you. And on the 25th day of the 11th month of this year, 2020, I heard the Lord say, My child, I am indeed coming very soon to take my people whom I have redeemed. I love you all with an everlasting love. There is no power which can separate you from my love. Be in my presence at all times. Until I come, hold fast what you have. I will guide you. Shalom. And coming to the visions which the Lord wanted us to share, the first one was on the 19th day of the 11th month of this year, 2020, and I saw a big waterfall. That was the background, and over that background, I saw the following words, written in different sizes and different colors. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And that was the end of the vision. Just staggering, just staggering, dear brothers and sisters. He who believes in me, out of his heart will flow what? Rivers of living water. Just staggering. Today the question is, what is flowing out of my heart out of our hearts that's the question dear brothers and sisters which we want to once again examine ourselves in our personal prayer time in our prayer closet and let messiah direct us as we give him the command of psalm 139 verses 23 and 24 and you can please go ahead and the second vision was on the 24th day of the 11th month of this year 2020 and i saw a rainbow in the sky over it was a dove and the background was the sky with some clouds. It was a picture, but it looked very real and very beautiful. And that was the end of the vision. And the third vision, the last one, was on the 25th day of the uh, 11th month of this year, 2020. And I saw an altar with fire on it. Over the altar, I saw the words, Rapture of Imminent, written in blue. Below the altar, I saw the words, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice written in light blue. And that was the end of the vision. 
Once again, Messiah is telling us, dear brothers and sisters, that rapture is imminent, but in the days that remain, offer your body, bodies as a living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1 and 2. If Messiah leaves you, please do revisit Romans 12, 1 and 2. That's a scriptural mandate for every true born again believer. And you can please go ahead, Anna. So today we see that Lord Jesus Christ is once again reminding us that he is coming soon and extremely soon to take us all home. And while we wait, Lord Jesus Christ is once again telling all of us to be in his presence and be ready. Today we are in session three of our study of what the Bible tells us about truly being ready for Lord Jesus Christ's imminent return. Luke chapter 21 verses 34 through 36 lay out Lord Jesus Christ's instructions regarding how we are to be ready for Christ's imminent return. In our first session, we looked at a brief overview of the final week, Lord Jesus Christ's final week. We looked at the differences between the discourses recorded in Matthew chapter 24 and Luke chapter 21. We also looked at a brief summary of the events of the end times. Last time, in our second session, we looked at what Lord Jesus Christ meant by the words, Take heed. And we looked at seven scriptures which warn us against deception. So let's revisit our text, Luke chapter 21, verses 34 through 36, before we begin with today's lesson. Lord Jesus Christ says, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So we are in verse 34 and today we will look at what Lord Jesus Christ tells us about worldliness. Lord Jesus Christ warns us about the things which will distract us and keeping keep us from being watchful and ready for the return of Lord Jesus Christ. Christ warns us against carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. And it is reminiscent of the third ground in the parable of the sower. The third ground was the thorny ground, which represented the people who received the word with joy, but were distracted with the cares of this world, the riches, and the pleasures of this life. Eventually, they bear no fruit. That's what we see in Matthew chapter 13, as well as Luke chapter 8. Today we will look at some examples of people in the Bible who were enticed, tempted, and deceived by the world and its temptations. We will then look at the antidote to worldliness as we learn from Lord Jesus Christ and the dangers of loving the world. First, let us take a look at seven scriptural examples of how the world deceives us. Number one, Adam and Eve. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve failed to obey God. Instead, they loved the world. Rather than God, they wanted a fruit which God had forbidden. In the entire Garden of Eden, there was only one tree of which God told Adam and Eve that they were not to eat. And yet, Satan deceived Eve into believing that it was a good thing to do. Adam and Eve cherished a piece of fruit more than the will of the one who created the fruit. They chose the fruit because it looked appealing rather than the will of God. The second example we have is Achan. In Joshua chapter 7, we find the Israelites battling against a city called Ai. In their conquest of the promised land, there were certain cities that they had to conquer. They had conquered Jericho, and the next thing they had to do was conquer Ai. But when they went to battle, they fled before the men of Ai, and the Canaanites who lived there struck down 36 Israelite men. Why this loss? Because there was a man who had transgressed and disobeyed God. God had commanded the Israelites not to touch anything from the spoils of Jericho. But a certain man called Achan of the tribe of Judah had seen a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels among the spoils. So the man coveted and took those, contrary to the instruction God had given the Israelites. Because of this trespass, they were defeated at Ai. 
At first the Israelites did not know anything about it, and Joshua fell on his face before the Lord when they saw how Israel was struck down at first. But God told Joshua what was going on. God told Joshua that a certain man had committed a trespass. So the next day, the tribes of Israel were brought tribe by tribe. They cast lots, and the tribes of Israel were brought, brought tribe by tribe. Judah was taken and brought clan by clan. The family of the Zarhites, or Judah's descendants by Zerah, was taken. They were brought household by household, and the house of Zabdi was taken. They were brought man by man, and the one chosen was Achan. Achan told what he had done. He had basically coveted what would be, in our day, a beautiful garment and a lot of money. A shekel of silver was about $128, and his shekel of gold was about $1,920. Achan coveted things from among that which God declared defiled. That's what the love of the world does. If we allow the world to take our focus away from God, we will end up disobeying God. That is what we see also in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve gave in to the enemy's deception, and they disobeyed God. It may not seem to be so evil, but by the time we understand, the world has trapped us and we find ourselves disobeying God. As we go along here, we will understand how the world tries to entice us and how we get deceived. Also, we will understand that if we give in to the schemes of the world, we will always end up disobeying what God has specifically told us. That is the danger of loving this temporal world and its pleasures. The third example we have of the world enticements in the scripture is Samson. In Judges chapter 13, we encounter a man named Manoah of the tribe of Dan, whose wife does not have any children. She's barren. But one day, the woman saw a man who told her that she would have a son. The biblical account seems to indicate that the man was Christ. He again appeared to her one day when she was with her husband and reminded them of what he had early said to the, earlier said to the woman. They offered a sacrifice and the man ascended in the flame of the sacrifice. He told them that their son was to be a Nazarite from the day of his birth and that they were to name their son Samson. According to the Torah, the Nazarites were not to do certain things. They were not to eat or drink anything that was produced by the grapevine. No razor was to come upon a Nazarite's head, and they were not to go near corpses, according to Numbers chapter 6. When Samson became a young man, there was a time when he went down and saw a Philistine woman and desired to have her as his wife. Although God was using it as an opportunity to move against the Philistines, on Samson's part, it was wrong for him to marry a foreigner. That was a command for all the Israelites. They were not to marry the uncircumcised. But Samson loved the world and disobeyed God. Moreover, when Samson was going to see her, he turned aside into a vineyard and, to his surprise, found a young lion, which he killed with his own hands. When he was returning, Samson turned aside to see the corpse, and he found that there was honey and a swarm of bees in it. So Samson took some of that honey and ate it. But God's instructions specifically for Nazarites was that they were not to go near any corpse. But Samson was attached to someone whom he should not have been, and meanwhile he disobeyed God in more than one way. Sometime after that, Samson loved another Philistine woman in the valley of Sarek named Delilah. A Nazarite was to be holy and set, set apart for God, but Samson mingles with the Philistines. He is not to keep company with a Philistine woman, but he loves the world, and it leads him to disobeying God. The Philistines pr promised Delilah a huge sum of money if she would entice Samson and make him tell her the secret of his strength. Three times, Samson responded falsely to her, but the fourth time, Samson was tired of it. Samson saw that Delilah wasn't going to give up, so he told her all that was in his heart, the whole story. When Samson was sleeping, Delilah called for someone to cut off his hair. When Samson awoke and saw the Philistines, he thought he would defeat them as usual. But this time, they captured him and took him. Samson loved the world and ended up in a place he should not have been. No razor was to come upon his head, but Samson chose the world over God 
and he thus disobeyed God. When we love the world, it allures us into a place where God does not want us to be. We start loving and longing for the things which God never intended for us. Once again, we see how the love of the world eventually leads us to disobeying God. And so very often we don't even realize it. We fail to understand that we have been set apart. Samson had been set apart from everything for God. God declared that he was to be a Nazarite, he was to be separate. And yet, the love of the world caused him to disobey God, keeping company with those whom he should not have. Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, that evil company corrupts good habits. When Samson's mind was on his Philistine bride, he disobeyed God by going near the corpse of the lion. And when his mind was set on Delilah, he was trapped, and when he realized it, it was too late. In both instances, Samson disobeyed God in not only not staying separate as a Nazarite, but also in keeping company with uncircumcised people whom God did not want any Israelite, not only the Nazarites, to indulge with. Loving the world is evil company, and it draws us away from God. A fourth example we have is King David. King David was a great king whom God called a man after his own heart, according to Acts chapter 13, verse 22. However, his heart, although his heart was always set on God, the love of the world caused him to commit a series of sins for a long period of time. During one spring in the reign of King David, his army went out to battle, but he stayed at his palace in Jerusalem. One day, looking from his rooftop, he saw a woman bathing, and she looked beautiful. The king sent for her and found that she was the wife of one of his soldiers. He unlawfully laid with her that night. When Bathsheba told him that she was with child, the king knew that it would be realized that he laid with her, because her husband wasn't. So the king called her husband Uriah and tried to make him lie with her, but Uriah, one of his soldiers, refused. So the king arranged to have Uriah killed in battle. And when Bathsheba's mourning was over, the king called for her and took her as his wife. Although it doesn't at first seem to be, it was a significant amount of time between this and when Nathan the prophet came to confront him, as recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Psalm 32 records what happened in the meantime. Although King David was Israel's best king because his heart was set on God, yet the love of the world drew him into a series of sins. First, he disobeyed God by coveting, then by committing adultery, then by murder. And once again, we see how love for the world leads us into disobeying God. King David had no lack of anything. He had many wives, many children, peace from all his enemies, wealth in abundance, and a prosperous reign. But when he set his mind on the world, he was led astray into disobeying God. The fifth example we have is Solomon. King David's first surviving son by Bathsheba was Solomon. Solomon started well. He loved God. He dedicated, as king, he de de dedicated seven years to building the temple. Moreover, when God came to him and gave him a chance to ask one thing, anything he desired, he did not ask for riches or wealth or possessions, but for wisdom. God commended and answered his request according to 1 Kings chapter 3. However, Solomon loved many women of foreign nations and married them. King Solomon married women of Egypt, Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and of the Hittites. King Solomon eventually had 700 princesses as his wives and 300 women as concubines. When Solomon became old, these foreign wives turned him away from God. He turned away from the one true God and began to worship the idols that his foreign wives worshipped. King Solomon had initially been a good king, but love for the world turned him away from God. Not only did he disobey God in marrying pagan wives, but he turned away from God, literally, and started worshipping idols. We thus see how dangerous the love of the world is. It leads us away from God. The sixth example, Judas Iscariot. We are all very familiar with the story of how 
Judas Iscariot betrayed Christ. But what was the reason behind it? It was his covetousness and greed, particularly the love of money. Judas Iscariot wanted to gain some money, so he went to the Pharisees and found a way to get some. From God's perspective, Judas was acting out prophecy. It wasn't just the immediate action, but the results also fulfilled the following prophecy. According to Psalm chapter 41, verse 9, Christ would be betrayed by a friend. And according to Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13, Christ would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, and the money would be used for the potter's field. But on the part of Judas Iscariot, it was a sin, and it didn't turn out well for him. In the longest recorded prayer of Lord Jesus Christ in Scripture, as we see in John chapter 17, Lord Jesus Christ said that he had lost none, none of those whom the Father had given him, except Judas Iscariot, whom he called the son of perdition. That meant that Judas was not under the care of Lord Jesus Christ. The son of perdition, moreover, is the title of the Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. That's what the love of the world did to Judas Iscariot. The seventh example we want to look at today is a companion of Paul by the name of Demas. We don't know much about Demas because we don't find him in the book of Acts. Demas is mentioned in the end readings of Paul, three of Paul's epistles, Colossians, Philemon, and 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy is commonly believed to be the last epistle Paul wrote, written shortly before his martyrdom. By that time, Demas had forsaken Paul. Why? Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, that Demas had forsaken him, having loved the present world. The love of the world drew Demas away from Paul. We don't know any more about Demas than that, but we do see how the love of the world moved him away from the Apostle Paul and the work of the Gospel. So we see how the world enticed and trapped many people, even in Scripture. Let's understand a few reasons why we should not love the world. We have a higher calling. We have not been called for or to the world, but out of it. We have been called to holiness. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6. And our destiny is heaven. The world is nothing compared to what God has for us in Lord Jesus Christ. Loving the world is also unreasonable. It is unreasonable in that the quest for the things of the world whether riches, fame, or whatever, is merely probable. We don't know if we will succeed in getting what we pursue in the world. Unforeseen circumstances often shatter our plans and expectations. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 11 says that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, but time and chance happen to them all. But the promises of God are certain. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. To leave the certainty of God's promises for the uncertainty of the world is unreasonable. It's also unreasonable in that if, even if we do gain that which we pursue in the world, we cannot keep these things without fear of losing them. No matter how confident we may appear to be, we do not know what is coming up tomorrow. We cannot be certain of anything in this world according to Proverbs Chapter 23, verse 5, chapter 27, verse 1, and elsewhere. But the quest to gain Christ, according to Philippians chapter 3, verse, verses 7 through 11, is not only certain of success, but it will never, ever be in vain. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 57 and 58. Lord Jesus Christ has promised to be with us always. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. And it is unreasonable to have to leave that which we can be sure of keeping for that of which we cannot be. It's also unreasonable to love the world because even if we can get and keep the things of the world, it will not satisfy us. The world may seem enticing, but it does, doesn't satisfy us. It always leaves us with emptiness. That's what we see in scriptures like Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 10, as well as Micah chapter 6 verses 14 and 15. But Christ will not leave us empty. If we drink of the water that he gives, we will never thirst. John chapter 4 verses 13 and 14 and chapter 6 verse 35. It is unreasonable to leave that which satisfies for that which leaves us empty. 
Loving the world is also scandalous. When professing Christians behave like the world, the unbelieving world looks at them and scoffs at true Christianity. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5, through 5, we read of end-time apostasy, which is characterized by those who have a form of godliness but deny its power, who are, among other things, covetous, lovers of money, and lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Such professing Christians, and even we, when we love the world, give the world a wrong impression of who God is. Therefore, it is scandalous to love the world. Loving the world is also idolatrous. Anything we value more than God is an idol for us. If we regard anything more than God, it is idolatry. If we love the world more than we love God, we have made an idol of it. Paul tells us in the in two different places that covetousness is idolatry. In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 5 and Colossians chapter 3 verse 5. Loving the world is being idolatrous. Loving the world is also dangerous. It is dangerous in that we expose ourselves to snares and hurtful lusts. Paul tells us that those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare as we see in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 7 through 11. It is also dangerous in that we lose our souls when we seek to gain the world. Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, and chapter 19, verse 23. We are in danger of eternal destruction when we love the world. Loving the world makes serving God impossible. We cannot serve God and mammon. It won't work. We cannot live for God and for the world. Matthew chapter 6 verse 24. Therefore, when we love the world, it is impossible to serve God. Loving the world makes us enemies of God. In James chapter 4 verse 4, James tells us that friendship with the world is enmity with God. We become enemy, enemies of God by loving the world and being friendly with the world. Psalm chapter 10 verse 3 tells us that God abhors the greedy. When we love the world, and long after the things of the world, it makes us enemies of God. Loving the world is hostile to growth in godliness. Peter exhorts us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But loving the world hinders that growth. In the parable of the sower, those represented by the thorny ground failed to bear fruit because of the love of the world. That's what we see in Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. Moreover, the world belongs to Satan. Satan is the god of this world, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, and the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. And this world lies under the sway of the wicked one, 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. Satan uses the world to trap many, as we saw in the seven scriptural examples. The enemy seeks to use the world to take us captive at his will. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 26. Therefore, we should not love the world. Loving the world also leads to apostasy. If we love the world, we will move away from God. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10 tells us that those who love money err from the faith. That's what happened to Demas as well. Love for the world makes us leave the things of God, and those who love the world thus apostatize. So we see why we should not love the world. It is a clear scriptural command not to love the world. John tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15-17, through 17, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. The world has three ways to try to trap us. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Before we end today, let us take a very brief look at the antidote to worldliness as we learn from Lord Jesus Christ himself. In Matthew chapter 4, we see how the enemy tried to tempt Christ with the kingdoms of this world. We cannot get into too much detail today, but let us understand how Lord Jesus Christ responded. The enemy said that if Christ would fall down and worship him, all the world would be his. 
But Lord Jesus Christ responded, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. What do we see here? For Jesus Christ fought the temptation of the world with scripture. Today as we end, let us understand what the world is and how it is used by the enemy to deceive us. Let us understand that this world is the enemy's instrument and the only way to fight it is through the scripture, the word of God. Let us understand how the world seeks to take us away from God and how it distracts us from being truly ready for Lord Jesus Christ's imminent return. As we wait upon the rapture, let us not give in to the attractions and the distractions of the world. Let the enemy not deceive us through the things of the world, and let us be in Lord Jesus Christ's presence today. And before we end today, here are a few questions for us to examine ourselves. Number one, what are the seven scriptural examples of the world's enticements as we saw today? And what is the lesson we learn from all of them? Number two, how was Eve deceived? What worldly thing did the enemy use to trap her? And what are the lessons we learn? Number three, who was Achan? What worldly thing did the enemy use to trap him? What are the lessons we learn? And what was the result of Achan's worldliness? Number four, how was Samson deceived? What worldly thing did the enemy use to trap him? And what are the lessons we learn? Number five, what was King David's mistake? What worldly thing did the enemy use to trap him? And what are the lessons we learn? Number six, what was King Solomon's mistake? What worldly thing did the enemy use to trap him? What was the result and what are the lessons we learn? Number seven, what was Judas's mistake? What worldly thing did the enemy use to trap him? And what did his worldliness lead to? And what are the lessons we learn? Number eight, who was Demas? What did his worldliness result in? And what are the lessons we learn? Number nine, what are some of the past, what are some of the reasons we should not love the world? And what does the Bible tell us about the love of the world according to 1 John chapter 2 verses 15 through 17? And number 10, what is the antidote to worldliness as we learn from Lord Jesus Christ himself in the accounts of Matthew chapter 4? And Luke chapter 4. Lord Jesus Christ is coming extremely soon. Today let us be in his presence and trust in him. And today let us fight the good fight, keep up the faith, and finish this race strong. Thank you everybody for viewing us. And may Lord Jesus Christ bless you all in abundance. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Once again, thank you so much Anna for reminding us once again and sharing with us the staggering vision and two very urgent words, Messiah telling that he's coming for his redeemed ones. It's very important to understand, dear brothers and sisters, that Messiah is not coming for everybody. Messiah is coming for his redeemed ones. When Messiah was praying in John chapter 17, a staggering, staggering prayer. If you haven't lately visited, dear brothers and sisters, the longest prayer recorded between the Father and Son, please do go for it. Let Ruach HaKodesh once again minister your soul. A staggering prayer every time. Every time you go through that, you cannot. You cannot be any more in your valleys, but come out once again and feel his presence. Be in his presence. Understand the Shekinah glory. That's what John 17 does. That's what Romans 8 does. That's what, that's what 1 Corinthians 15 does. As a matter of fact, the entire world of God, which is God breathed, Theopinistus does that. But dear brothers and sisters, Today, Anna shared with us the harmful, deleterious effects of worldliness. We often forget to understand the fact that the world is actually our enemy. The world is our enemy. We often fail to understand. We only think about the world as our enemy when we, whatever we want to get in our flesh, when we don't get it. When we go through a certain suffering or things alike, then we start thinking that this world is our enemy or the enemy is attacking us, dear brothers and sisters. 
If this world is our enemy and we are placed in this world, then we need to understand that we are at war. And that is why God, Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, has given us seven pieces, seven pieces of our spiritual armor to fight the good fight in His might. We need to fight the world in Messiah's might, dear brothers and sisters. Today, we don't quite understand what Paul was telling that I mean no him. The, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being confirmed to his death. What does that mean? We don't quite understand that because we don't hear that from the modern pulpits. We don't hear that from whatsoever Bible scholar, teacher. We don't hear that from the social media that I may know him. Is that my quest? For brethren, I am determined to know nothing amongst you except Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach and him crucified. Is that my only determination? Because this is eternal life, the Bible says, dear brothers and sisters, that I may know the one true living God, Hashem, and His only begotten Son, our Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. That's it. We don't have to know all the things of the world, how all the different operating system works, what all different kinds of Modern frontiers of science, whatever it is bringing, what different technology, molecular biology techniques we are using, what is exactly this CRISPR technology about, what is, why do we need all this different DNA, RNA and protein inserts, we need to know nothing. Because that is not eternal life, that is the quest for wood, hay and stubble. And that is accounted. And the worldliness, dear brothers and sisters, oftentimes because of the watered down gospel, because of the upside down gospel, because of man's idea of God, not God's idea of God. Today we have started thinking that if we are, if we live our life good enough, our good works will outweigh our bad works and that's how God will reward us. Because I did all the good things in the world. Yes, there are a few bad things. But when we see the balance sheet, so God will be happy with me. If that is the case, then Messiah did not have to die an excruciating, brutal death for a wretch like me and you and each one of us. A death which we can never ever imagine. I gave my back to those who struck me. I gave my cheeks. To those who plucked out my beard. The Bible says. The prophecy of Isaiah. I did not hide my face. From shame and spinning. That's the king of kings. And the lord of lords. Lord of our life. Yeshua HaMashiach. He did not hide his face. From shame and spinning. I won't offer my face to anybody to spit upon. But my Lord did. How thankful am I to be? Am I going to go for this horizontal quest in the name of the Lord? Is that the power of the empty garden tomb? Because the Bible says Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, that same power which raised our Messiah, our King, our Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach. The same spirit dwells in you and me. What is that spirit leading us to today? Horizontal quest, worldly pursuits, our ambitions, our goals, promotions, worldly ambitions, materialistic positions, big house, the best car. What is it? What is it that drives me today? What is it? What happened to in him? And in Him alone, I have my being. I move and live and have my being. What happened to that? Today we don't quite understand what Messiah said when he said the prophecy of Psalm 69.9. The zeal for thine house has eaten me up. The reproaches of that reproach of thee has fallen on me. I don't want those reproaches. Why should I? 
the zeal for thine house. We have started thinking that it is all about the building church, the atmosphere, the good programs the church can offer, the good music, the upbeat music and things alike. But that's not what Messiah was telling. The zeal for thine house means that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. This is Paul writing in Philippians 3, 10. It's about approximately 30 years, dear brothers and sisters, after the road to Damascus experience when he met Messiah face to face. After 30 years of being in faith, now we see there is a pseudo humility and a tinge of pride which builds up. People who are in, and please don't get us wrong, dear brothers and sisters, please, please don't get us wrong. This is not to point at others. Once again, we need to really understand and examine our faith and examine from Messiah's lens. Today, people who have been longer in faith, unfortunately, the way they try to portray is they appears. It's like if we see in if, if it is an academic example, then they are the dean of the College of Faith. And the young ones are just, just in their undergrad and grad, grad school. That's not how it works. We all need the same grace, that same amazing grace every single day till we see our Messiah face to face. And till that day, Messiah says he has saved Special people, his holy nation, chosen people, a chosen generation for him who is zealous for the good works which Messiah has preordained for each one of us. Ephesians 2.10, Titus 2.14 is an authority on that. He is not interested in what I accomplish in this world, dear brothers and sisters. Messiah is not. As a matter of fact, with the little time we have, let's jump in. We are still in the book of 1 Peter. We took a short detour, but it turns out that it is a longer detour. So we are trying to see what exactly, through the lens of Philippians 3, we are in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, where Peter says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God today. We don't quite understand what is judgment. We talk about Holy Spirit. We talk about Ruach HaKadosh. And Messiah gives us the function. What is the role? It is in the word of God. What is the role of Holy Spirit? Ruach HaKadosh convicts the world of sin, righteousness and judgment. None of those things we want to hear today. I don't want to hear about my sin. I don't want to hear about the righteous things which God has saved me for. I just want that imputed righteousness and want to walk on that horizontal axis, x-axis oriented towards the world and say that I am saved. But now I can do every single thing. You are great. And now let me post you my own things, dear brothers and sisters. That's not why God saved you and me. Today we don't understand sin, righteousness and judgment. We truly need to revisit the inerrant and in inerrant word of God, infallible word of God, which says that the Holy Spirit convicts you and me of sin, righteousness and judgment. So Peter is telling us, and for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? So there is a consequence, all consequences, if I may. For not obeying the gospel of God. That's what Peter is telling us. That's not a conjecture. That's not a speculation. Every word is God breathed Theopneustus. Theo says God knew my breath. 2 Timothy 3.16 is our authority. Tells us that every word is God breathed. So there is there are consequences for not obeying the gospel of God. So we are trying to see what exactly this obedience is about. So we are now as a matter of fact. In Philippians chapter 3, we are seeing verse 15. Verse 15, Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 3, 
verse 15, Paul tells us, Recalls that let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded and if in anything you be otherwise minded he be otherwise minded God shall reveal even this unto you so we are trying to understand because God is only interested in his promises what he says in the scripture we can take this to our prayer classes and we can ask Lord you said you will reveal to us and that's what we are trying to understand, how exactly God reveals. And from that, last time, Messiah took us a detour. In Jeremiah chapter 6, I believe we did from verses 10 through 19. Today, as a matter of fact, let us understand once again the generation we are in, the time we are in, the, the perilous times, the demonic times we are living in. It's so very crucial, dear brothers and sisters, to understand that today, if you would please bear with me, Today, Messiah is leading. We will just read through. It's not about preach from the word. It says preach the word. Right? Paul was telling to Timothy, preach the word. So let's together read Messiah's inerrant and infallible word. God breathed word. Let Ruach HaKodesh speak to our hearts. Let Messiah speak to our hearts so that his will is accomplished in us and through us. So if you would please, and if we have time after that, we will get back to our Philippians 3, verse 15, trying to understand about God's will. But if you would please turn to Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1, once again, guess we are doing something radical. Let's see what Messiah has for us. Malachi chapter 1. Malachi once again is a staggering, staggering book. It's a very short book. If Lord leads you, please do go for it. It's about this very time we are living in. It's a staggering, staggering book. Malachi as a matter of fact means my messengers. And despite many, many scholastic conjectures, we believe that, that Malachi, he was probably a person with this proper name. So once again, Malachi, as we understand that this is the last book of the Old Testament. But once again, let us not forget, dear brothers and sisters, what Messiah told us in Matthew 11, 13, Luke 16, 16, that it does not, the Old Testament does not complete with Malachi, but John the Baptist, John the Baptist does complete the Old Testament. So we see the background and setting of Malachi. We won't get into a greater detail, but we see the background and setting of the book of Malachi where the temple was rebuilt. The priestly worship is carried being carried on, people had fallen into spiritual decline and their attitudes developed later into, in, into the, sects of, the sects of Pharisees and Sadducees. Oh, very similar to the time we are living in, dear brothers and sisters. We see people being insensible to the love of Hashem displayed toward them. We see people being un unaware of the enormity of their de departure from the will and the way of Hashem. And we see that people lacked reverence for Hashem. For our one true living God, Yeshua HaMashiach. Doesn't that describe the church today, the building church today? It's so highly unfortunate, dear brothers and sisters. Without getting into greater detail, so we see this is in the post-exilic here. Exilic era where we see in their minds the Israelites, the repatriated Jews, now they are thinking that it was supposed to be different. The land was to rebound with miraculous fruitfulness, as Ezekiel promised in Ezekiel 34, verses 26 through 30. The, the population would swell, as Isaiah said in Isaiah 54, verses 1 through 3. The nation was to rise to a glorious reign of. A new David, as Jeremiah 23 verses 5 and 6 said, and all the nations were to come and serve them, as Isaiah 49 verses 22 and 23 says. But the realities of life just turns out to be the opposite. The land languished under drought, Malachi 3.10 tells us. The population remained a fraction of what it had been. And the nation continued under the political dominion of Persia. Harvests were poor and subject to locust damage, as Malachi 3.11 tells us. And most hearts were indifferent or resentful toward Hashem, toward Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. 
And both the priests and the people were violating the stipulations of the Mosaic law regarding sacrifices, tithes, and offerings. And the people's hope in Hashem's covenant promises had dimmed. As it was evidenced by their intermarriages with pagans, the, the moral decay of the society. And today we see so much of it, dear brothers and sisters, how it parallels our own time. How it parallels our own time, how it parallels America today. Biblical promises seem remote, resulting in neglect and disobedience. So with that background, dear brothers and sisters, let's pick it up, Malachi Chapter 1, let's do, let's pick it up verse 6 and we'll go all the way till the end, verse 14. Verse 6 through 14, Malachi chapter 1, if you would please open up your Bibles, dear brothers and sisters. So Malachi records, a son honors his father and a servant his master. And Hashem is speaking now. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts, Adonai Sevaot. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts to you, priests who despise my name. Not much has changed today, dear brothers and sisters. Unfortunately, the building churches will be perhaps leading to many more people to lake of fire than we can imagine. That's exactly what Luke 21 verses 34 through 36 is about. Today, the church is missing the eschatology. There is no vibrant expectation of Messiah's imminent return which is being taught in the building churches. And it is this expectation of every true born again believer which purifies us, which sanctifies us. Oh, Holy Father, thy word is truth. Sanctify them by thy truth. To you, priests, who despise my name. Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled, defiled food on my altar. But say, in what way we have defiled you? By saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? So today we don't quite understand. We think, wait a minute. Those are all the old sacrifices under the mosaic system. That has nothing to do with us. So we are okay. We are in the new covenant. We are saved by the precious, priceless, holy blood of Yeshua HaMashiach. Then we have not understood the new covenant. Let's understand Romans 12, 1 and 2. If, if you would please turn to Romans 12, 1 and 2. Let's real quick take a look. And Romans 12, 1 and 2, this is New Testament. This is Apostle Paul talking about. We have all this discussion about different dispensation and things like that. So this is Apostle Paul talking about. Apostle Paul says, I beseech you, therefore. I beseech you, therefore. That's a strong, strong word. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What is Paul telling us? I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God. Daddy present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy acceptable unto God. Which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That he may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Quite a statement. We can truly spend days on that, on that Romans 12, 1 and 2 on those two verses, dear brothers and sisters. If Messiah leads you, please do go for it. As a matter of fact, if, you're in, if Messiah leads you, Please do take a printout or write it on an index card. 
However, Messiah leads you. Maybe it's, it will be a good idea. Please do prayer over to stick it, stick it in your bedroom to stick, stick it in your workplace, in your cubicle, maybe on the on the on the bathroom mirror, wherever. Because we need to remind ourselves, dear brothers and sisters, of what God's promises are, what Messiah. Mercy is what is the role of Messiah's mercy? We understand that his mercy is new every morning. There's nothing new about a morning except Messiah's mercy. But what is the role of that mercy? By the mercies of God, what do we do? That he present your body is a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And here in Malachi, we see the parallel. In Malachi, if you would please go back to Malachi. Chapter 1, we are in chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Hashem is telling you, for defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way we have defiled you? By saying the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? When I don't present my body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord, is it not evil? Am I doing a favor by spending 15 minutes of my daily devotion to Hashem, my maker, my creator, whom I am accountable, whom I will be standing in front of one day, whenever that day is? Can I not set my smartphone away when I approach the throne of grace? Or I only set my smartphone away when I am in severe need or want. A vibrant, a living relationship by abiding in the wine for the branches is very crucial, dear brothers and sisters, for the branch to bear fruit. That's what the word of God says. Where are we today? Is it not evil if I am not presenting my body as a living sacrifice? I want his mercies, but I don't want to do what the Bible tells me to do with Messiah's mercies. Is that not evil? That's what is the question. That's what is Hashem's question today. That's what he's telling in Malachi 1. Nothing has changed. We can always have the epicalima. As Peter says, the cloak for vice, the covering for our sin. Oh, because Harry did that, Sally did that, because of Andrew. I don't say that no, actually, it was my mistake. No, actually, I did not pay attention to that. No, actually, I gave him the wrong information. It never comes out, does it? That is why we are in so much more need of his amazing grace. That is why we are in so much need of telling Messiah, giving him the command of search and lead. Oh, search me. Search me, oh God. Create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. What happened to that? Why do we don't why don't we give those commands anymore? And if we are, are we truly believing? Are we truly believing? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. What happened to that? Lord says, you offer defiled food on my altar, but say in what way have we defiled you? By saying the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? When I am giving the leftover time of mine and not presenting my body as a living sacrifice to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, is it not evil? All I am approaching God to know is, tell me when is the rapture? Tell me when is the rapture? Is it not evil? That's the question, dear brothers and sisters. Once again, please don't get us wrong. Please don't get us wrong, dear brothers and sisters. Let Messiah's word speak to your heart. Not my word, not what I speak. It doesn't matter, dear brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter what I say or Anna or David say, dear brothers and sisters. All that matters on that day is what Hashem's word says. 
It's not about interpreting, finding a teacher who will interpret the word the way I want. That is the danger. That is the danger. We go back to 2 Timothy chapter 4. The first five verses. As a matter of fact, 1 Timothy chapter 4 as well. Talks about that. And then Hashem continues, offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? If we offer our boss our leftover time, whoever in our workplace or whoever in whatever circumstance, hopefully we can put the point across. If we offer that to our senior, to our boss, to our group leader. The same way we are treating Hashem. The same way we are treating Messiah Yeshua HaMashiach. Giving him 10 minutes as if it's a favor I am doing to him. Because I am better than Harry. I am better than Andrew. I am better than Sally. Because they don't even do that. On that day that's not what the question will be. The question is not that he has saved you and me. That we can do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not to Harry, Sally or Andrew or anybody. But to Messiah's image. Let us never forget dear brothers and sisters. Hashem gave his best. God gave himself. God doesn't want our leftovers. God wants us. Present your body as a living sacrifice. He is not interested in my service in the church for 20 minutes, 2 hours, whatever. Playing perhaps an instrument, playing or being in the choir or being doing some work in the church. If Lord leads, that is not a Wrong thing to do to your brothers and sisters. But he is not interested. That is not a substitute for presenting my body as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God. Which is our reasonable service. And that only happens not with a determination. Not with a new year resolution. But it only happens by receiving the mercies of God. Which is new every single morning. And then verse 9, Hashem continues, But now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us. While this is being done by your hands, will he accept you favorably? Says the Lord of hosts, Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, Adonai Sebaot. Nor will I accept an offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. Today we don't quite understand what that means. The world is tired to look at professing Christians talking about big things about the cross. But when they look at our life, it is not even at par with the pagan, with the heathen. We are misrepresenting Christ at all times, our Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. How seriously have we taken our ambassadorship? The one who will lose his life for me. Will find it. But one who finds his life will lose it. We are called to be losers. The last will be first and the first will be last. We are called to be last. God picked the foolish people of the world. The attributes of a true born again believer. He is last. He is foolish. And he is a loser. How does that sound? Doesn't sound good does it? Your brothers and sisters, that's what the world does. That's what being aligned on the x-axis, that's the danger. We tend to become like the world. We are governed by the principles of this world. 
the world is not going to get to a better place. Today, the church has forgotten the rule, the very root word, ecclesia, ecclesia. The Greek word ecclesia means the called out ones. The church, the role of the church is not to make this world a better place, but to call out the chosen ones, the predestined ones, by yielding to Messiah's Ruach. That's the role of the church. That's what the biblical, the scriptural role of the church is, dear brothers and sisters. Today we misrepresent every single minute. We are misrepresenting our great God and Lord Yeshua HaMashiach. We don't even think twice. We are ready to mingle with the world. We are ready to be pleasing people at the cost of trampling the cross of Calvary. Messiah did not. It was not those nails which held him dead, held him on that cross on that day, dear brothers and sisters. Messiah would have told long time back, I don't want this, I'm out of here. But he looked at even before we were born, he, you and me, we were on his mind. He said, I am not going to give up. I am going to go through all of this. Because if I do, then my son and my daughter, they will be running in the lake of fire forever. Because they don't have a way. When we see Apostle John, he is convulsively, he is weeping. Why? Because he understood something which me and you, we are missing. We are doomed. We don't have any hope in and of ourselves. That's when Messiah comes. That's when he's told that the Lamb has prevailed. The Lion of Judah has prevailed. Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, has prevailed. He has paid the price in full. Tetelestai, it is finished. It was not those nails. It was not the power of the Roman soldiers. Or the Jewish leaders. We all are the beneficiaries of the love story, which is written in the precious, priceless, holy blood of our King, our Messiah, our soul sustainer, our breath giver, Yeshua HaMashiach. On that wooden cross, which was erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. We don't even think twice today. We trample the cross of Calvary. We mingle with the world. world Somehow or the other. Because we don't hide his word in our hearts. We don't know how to fight the world. We don't know how to because the Bible says, How can a young man cleanse his way? By hiding Hashem's word, Messiah's word in his heart. We don't know. That is the only offensive weapon in our spiritual armor. The sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. What is today the status of our ambassadorship? Have we truly, have we today, are we the light of the world being Messiah's reflected glory? Are we the salt of the earth? And sometimes it's not about just going out and evangelizing. Sometimes it is just ourselves that we, whatever preferences we are having, we choose not to do that because Hashem is telling us, Messiah is telling us to do something else by obedience. We choose that. We take that leap of faith. I do not understand, Lord, but because, because you are merciful, because you are faithful, because you are just, I come and choose this way, Lord. My flesh will hinder and not let me do it, Lord, but you are the potter and I am the clay. So mold me and make me and make me walk in your ways, Lord. The way which you have ordained for me. Lord, your word says narrow is the way and it is only going to get narrower. Lord, when the road, the way gets narrower and narrower. Please don't leave my hand. Please don't take these trials away from me. But through these trials, empower me. You said when I walk through the water, you will be with me. You will be with me in that water. 
more. Please come with me, Lord. Please come with me. Walk with me in that water. Don't take me away so that your ordained purposes be fulfilled through me. So that you be glorified. So you be exalted through my actions, through my thoughts, through my deeds. Is that the reality today of my life, of our lives, of your life, dear brothers and sisters? Malachi records for, you're running out of time, so let's, let's verse 11, let's pick it up, verse 11, and go till verse 14, verse 11. Malachi records, for from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name, and a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the nations. Says Adonai Sevaot. But you profane it, in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled, and its fruit, the, its food is contemptible. You also say, Oh, what a weariness, and you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts, and you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? Should I accept this? The Bible says, present your body as a living sacrifice. I'm giving my leftover time, five minutes, ten minutes. That also I am having an eye on the notifications on my smartphone. I am not taking those thoughts captive, which is a scriptural mandate. Second Corinthians chapter 10 verses 5 and 6. I am thinking about certain things and then I just do my daily devotion. Perhaps read one chapter from the scripture and that's it. That's it. Is that what Lord Deserves from you and me, the creator of heaven and earth, my maker, our maker, the creator of everything, what we can see and what we cannot see. Is that what we should give to our living God? What did he give? For God demonstrated his love in this, that while we were ungodly, while we were without strength, while we were sinners, while we were his enemies. He died an excruciating, brutal death on that wooden cross. It was not the nails, dear brothers and sisters. It was his profound love, so vast, so expensive, that you and me cannot ever imagine. We will never know the cost to see my sins upon that cross. I will never know the cross. I will never know. None of us will know on this side of eternity. The cost involved. Am I going to give him all the leftovers for the days that remain? And verse 14 says, But cursed, but cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. Is everything what I'm offering to the Lord? Is blemish because let us once again remember it's not about just our time just our tithes just the things just our talents I myself present your body not your talents not your tithes present your body as a living sacrifice holy holy is set apart for Hashem and Hashem alone holy and acceptable to Hashem am I if I'm not then I'm either not receiving his mercies or I am Misutilizing those mercies for a fleshly purpose. But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, Adonai Sevaot, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Lord's name has to be feared. But with our consciences seared, we don't understand. We don't quite understand what is reverence, revering God. The fear of the Lord, Bible says, is the beginning of wisdom. Today, we lack wisdom. Why? And what exactly is fear of the Lord? Proverbs 8, 13 tells us that it is hating evil as fear of the Lord. Today, evil we have incorporated in our DNA. It has started expressing. We see the mRNA. We see the protein now. In function. 
Today is the day to chop it off. Today is the day to come to his presence. Today is the day to take Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that he present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world is a command. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that he may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. We will pick it up, dear brothers and sisters, in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Next time, we'll understand more about God's will. Because this is where it starts understanding God's will. If our minds are not renewed, Romans 12, 2 tells us we will never, never in our flesh be able to understand God's will. So we'll pick it up as Messiah leads us, Messiah willing, we will pick it up. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, understand Philippians 3, 15 from the lens of Romans 12, 1 and 2. And Hash, as Messiah Hashem leads us, let Hashem's will be done through us and in us, dear brothers and sisters. Messiah's return is truly, truly upon us in the days that remain. Let us offer our body by the mercies of God, by receiving the mercies of our great God and Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, whose name is great among the nations and greatly to be praised. Let us receive his mercies and let us present our body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, holy and acceptable unto our great God and Lord Yeshua HaMashiach. And let us today end with a short word of prayer. Shall we, Anna? Yes. All right, you can please go ahead. Lord Jesus, once again, I thank you, Lord, for being with us, Lord, and for once again reminding us, Lord, that you are coming soon and extremely soon, Lord, to take us all home, Lord, to be with you, Lord. And help us, Lord, as we wait upon you, Lord, to be in your presence, Lord, and to do what you have called us to do, Lord. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Once again, thank you so much, Anna, for praying for us. We thank you so very much once again, all of your fellow brethren, for viewing us, for being a part of our spiritual family, dear brothers and sisters, more than words can ever explain. We thank you with from the bottom of our hearts, dear brothers and sisters, for being a spiritual family, it is indeed not our like-mindedness, but Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 tells us, it is Messiah's Ruach which unifies us. So let us lay it all down at the cross today, and let us present our body as a living sacrifice. He is a great God, He is a good God, and He is a God who will see us through no matter what we are. And on the other side of chasm, He will on that day embrace you and me. And say, well done, well done, my good and faithful servant. As we aspire to hear those words from Messiah, let us, let us once again not forget the three D's which the enemy is going to attack us with. Doubt, division, and deception. Doubt, division, and deception. Let's fight those with the three P's. Prayer, penitence, and perseverance. Prayer, Penitence and perseverance. We thank you so very much, all of your fellow brethren, once again for viewing us. And may Lord God Almighty Yeshua HaMashiach bless each and every one of you. Shalom.